Let me introduce to you our guest speaker. A little bit on Lou. Growing up in a small town in Illinois, Louise, or Lou, uh, decided to join the Army in order to see the world. How many of you guys did that, to see the world? Yeah. And um, after graduating as a registered nurse in June of 1968, she attended basic training, then headed to Fort Dix, New Jersey, for her first duty assignment. In September 1969, she received orders for Vietnam, arriving there on November 1. During her year at the 91st EVAC Hospital, she cared for GIs, South Vietnamese soldiers and civilians, and even Viet Congs and NVA soldiers. From malaria and hepatitis to double amputees, massive head injuries and traumas and deadly bullet wounds, Lieutenant Rao saw it all. Since 1970, she has made four returns to Vietnam. The latest in September of 2014. There might be another one in between. It. And, uh, and when she joined 11 other veterans making their first return trip to the country. For the past 30 years, Lou's been very busy in the community, especially working with folks suffering, suffering from Parkinson's disease. Lou lives with her husband in Kansas and Leewood. Uh, Overland Park, excuse me, Overland Park? And Leewood now, okay, I thought so. And they have two grown children and two grandkids. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm fish welcome to Lou Eisenbrandt. Yet. You're supposed to wait till I should. First of all, I am so delighted that Lou came because I didn't make it out at early in the morning when you got, got presented her to. So I am thrilled. A um, couple things. First, uh, listening to all these stories of heroism, I don't think I have any story of heroism. I just was different than the average nurse at in 1969. Um, there are, there's a t-shirt that says not everybody wore love beads. Well, I actually wore love beads and a dog tag. So I, and I have a peace symbol over there I wore too. So I covered all bases. I see a few familiar faces. I will tell you, for those of you who don't know, I've had Parkinson's for 19 years. You can see me bouncing. Um, and I did have a glass of wine earlier and my meds, so it's about as calm as I'm going to get. Um, let me, first of all, acknowledge my husband because I no longer drive due to my Parkinson's. And that was, that was difficult um, for those of you who have given up your driving. Uh, um, okay. I have a little competition from someone in the back. <laughs> it's called the technical difficulty, and it happens to all of us. Um, anyway, so my husband, Jim, is, who is now retired from a great law practice, uh, when people ask him what he does, he says he drives Miss Lou. So that's his new role. So thank you, sweetie. Um, I want to mention a couple things before I get started. I am living with Parkinson's, as I said. I've been very active in the uh, Parkinson's Foundation. I've had it for 19 years. I did file a claim with the VA in 2008, which was accepted, so I get a little stipend every month. And Parkinson's is kind of at the top of the list for things that are conditions that are recognized by the VA. Um, thanks to Agent Orange, which, as we all know, has done, wreaked havoc on lots, lots of people. Um, so I do have some, if anybody has the Parkinson's or if you know somebody, especially if they're a veteran, please, there's information on the Parkinson's Foundation. We are starting a new initiative this year to coordinating veterans and Parkinson's Foundation. So. We're trying to give more and more um, information to veterans who are, are living with Parkinson's. 
Uh, the other thing I will mention that's over there, besides my book, which is available for $20 if you're interested, um, is a magazine from the Veterans Voices Writing Project. This is a 75-year-old organization that has been in uh, headquartered in Kansas City for all these years, and it offers veterans a chance to write. We find that writing is very therapeutic, whether it's poetry or it's um, prose or just getting something off your chest. And there is information there. They have a website. And if you are interested, they also now accept art and photographs. So there's information over there and help yourself. There's one other thing I want to mention before I start, and that is you will see a purple heart laying over there. It's not mine. It is mine, but I did not earn it. And I make this very clear. I know we always hear stories about guys who, I say guys because most of the women didn't get medals, period, but who claim they got something that they didn't get. The purple heart that's over there was a gift to me from a patient at Fort Dix before I even went to Vietnam. He came back and he had some wounds that still needed attention and he was on my floor as a nurse. And the day I got orders, I came in and said, Gail, guess what, I'm going where you just came from, I'm going to Vietnam. And he opened his bedside drawer and he took out this beautiful case and said, here, I want you to have this. And I looked at it and there was a purple heart. And I said to him, why are you giving me your purple heart? I, I don't deserve that. And he said, yes, you do. Because if you're going to Vietnam as a woman, as a nurse, you probably won't be recognized. And you're going to earn it. And I tried to talk him out of it, and he would not. He said, if you don't take it, I'll leave it in the drawer. So I took it, and I share it because I speak to a lot of students. And I think it means more if you see something that you've heard about. So the Purple Heart belongs to me, but I did not earn it. And I did not get a medal. He was right about that. So having said all that, I want to uh, take you through my year in Vietnam. Like Paul said, I've been back four times. And it's been very interesting revisiting Vietnam. But after my stint at Fort Dix, I got orders from Vietnam. I got a vanilla envelope in the mail one day that said, congratulations, you're going to Vietnam. I'm not sure that we saw that as a cause for celebration, but uh, when you're married to Uncle Sam for a few years, you go where they send you. So I took a month leave, went to my hometown in Illinois, and then left for Vietnam on the 31st of December, of uh, October 1969. So this is where my slides start. Okay, you'll see this picture on my cover of my book. It's also on several of the veteran websites. Somebody really liked this picture, I don't know, and it's traveled around. But um, this was on a little weekend pass we got to get away from the hospital, and I was 22 years old. Okay. This is, from where I look at it, it's hard to see, but most of you know Vietnam, have heard, not, of course you've all heard of Vietnam. Most of you know a little bit about the country. This is simply a map of the south part of Vietnam, which was known then as South Vietnam. And I was stationed at Chu Lai, which is near the top. There's a little asterisk next to it. Um, I always said if I had to pick it again, I'd go to the same place because we were, hospital was on a cliff overlooking the South China Sea, which was quite nice. Next. The day I arrived, I looked like this, and I looked like this for the rest of the year. We all wore fatigues, the nurses. There was one hospital in Saigon where they wore whites, but the rest of us all wore fatigues. I had my dog tags around my neck, and you can see there are lots of sandbags as protection against incoming rockets. So I spent four days in Long Bend before I, they asked me where I wanted to go. And I said, I've never been to Vietnam. How would I know where I want to go? Um, but my former roommate at Fort Dix was stationed at the 91st in July, and so I thought, well, at least I'd know one person. 
So I did get my duty assignment was, was the 91st. Okay. And when I arrived at the 91st, five days later, it was monsoon season up there. So you can see the South China Sea was a bit angry um, and they lost my luggage. So I arrived in a war zone with nothing but a toothbrush. Um, but they found the luggage eventually. So it's no different than domestic travel is what I can say. Next. And eventually the sun came out. So this is the housing. This is where I lived the, on the bottom, uh, as I look at it, left-hand side. Is that right? There's an orange door. Okay. Can tell what Parkinson's messes, messes with your spatial thing, and you can't remember if you're right or left. Anyway, that's, that is my room. The orange door, our rooms were basically an 8 by 12, something, with a single bed, a metal cabinet, and a foot locker, and a fan, if you were lucky enough to buy one from the person who vacated before you. The structure in front is a bunker uh, where we spent time when we had rocket attacks. The first person in got to chase out the rats because they lived in there when we weren't in there. So, okay. And as I told you, this wa it was a beautiful location. And it, when it was 120 degrees, it was only 110 because we got a little ocean breeze. So um, I, in one of my trips back where I know I got to where the hospital had been, if you look, there's a little island out in the middle on the horizon. And that's how I knew that I was back when, we, when I went back in 1996 because the hospital was totally gone at that point. Next. I take the, I add this picture, and by the way, all of these pictures I took. Um, I add this picture for students who don't have a clue what Vietnam looks like or what the war was about sometimes. Um, but you can see it's a long, narrow country. Very, this was the hot and dry season. There are two, hot and wet, hot and dry. And the, um, the mountain range that runs the length of the country is in the background. And we were fortunate enough to be on the cliff overlooking this beautiful uh, beach coastline. Now, that's when the rockets weren't flying. Okay. I went up one day with a loach pilot in a little chopper and hung outside, well, there was no door, the side opening, and was able to take some aerial shots. So this is my hospital. Um, as you can see, it's metal Quonset huts. It was not like MASH. They weren't tents. Um, two wards on the left were medical, and that's where I saw anything that wasn't a war wound. Malaria from mosquitoes, hepatitis from drinking dirty water, jungle rot, which is, happens if you wear your boots for five or six days in a row and you don't have dry socks and you don't have dry boots and you get big sores on your legs, and then the sores get infected. So um, I even had a colonel who had a heart attack. So anything that wasn't a war wound, I took care of in the medical wards. And then we had things that you'd have in any hospital, um, emergency room, uh, ICU, surgery. Um, we also had a POW ward where we kept NVA and VC. Uh, we had a Vietnamese civilian ward where we took care of uh, civilians who were wounded. The building that looks like it's about to fall off the cliff is the officers club where uh, uh, occasionally alcohol was consumed. Um, and the sort of Pentagon shaped green building in the middle was the mess hall where we enjoyed such delights as jello. Now, when it's 120 degrees, it, it's not jello very long. Um, my favorite were everything, of course, was served in big metal pans, were the mashed potatoes, because they thought they weren't very colorful, I guess, and they put maraschino cherries on the top of it, which <laughs> makes for an interesting Thanksgiving dinner. Um, the other thing I want to point out is down at the bottom of the cliff is a little tiny beach, which we enjoyed. Uh, until about three months after I left and a typhoon came and apparently wiped out the little bitty beach. The other thing is in the background you'll see a large amphitheater. 
And that is where I got to see Bob Hope, but I never knew how or who built the amphitheater. Well, I was speaking to a group of vets in uh, Atlanta a few years ago, and a guy in the front row said, well, the Marines built that. Now, you know, the Marines take a lot of credit for a lot of stuff, <laughs> but I don't have any proof that they didn't build it, so I'll have to buy that. And I said, well, why did they do it? And he said, so you could see the Bob Hope show. And I said, well, it worked. <laughs> okay, next. So this is where I worked for the first three months. This was the medical ward. Obviously, I arrived on the 1st of November, so we were getting ready for Christmas. I have no idea where the Santa and the deer, reindeer came from, but um, somebody got a care package, I'm guessing, and that's how it arrived. Next. And after three months, I was invited by the chief nurse to move on to the emergency room, which I accepted. And so for the next eight months, eight and a half months, I worked in the emergency room. I will just, I will say to you, I did nursing in that eight and a half months that I w would never have done in a lifetime. I think even working in a emergency room in a, a major inner city hospital, you don't see what we saw on a regular basis. Um, as you can see, it's very practical. Uh, everything was at the re within our reach. Yes, glass IV bottles. I always have to tell that to the kids because they've never seen a glass IV bottle, but that's the way they were back then. Um, the, if they were patients were not ambulatory, we would carry them in on litters, put them on the sawhorses, and assign a nurse to each casualty as long as they held out. We, sometimes we had more casualties than we had nurses. Um, and everything was sort of destruction proof. I mean, we, the first thing we did when we got the guys in was we cut off their clothes because you can't assess war wounds if you don't, if you leave fatigues on. You can't find shrapnel. Almost everybody had shrapnel of some sort. Uh, lots of amputees, most of them from stepping on mines. Um, I remember my second day I was in the emergency room, my patient had a, one leg missing at the knee and the other leg was attached with a few ligaments but dangling with his boot on and it did not make it through surgery. Um, you see some screens in the background. Those were only used in situations where we got, if we got KIAs in who were already in body bags. Um, or if we got in someone, some of the severe head wounds. And when we did triage, it was decided that this, this individual was not going to survive. There was, there was nothing we could do for him at that point. Many of them were still breathing. And if one of us nurses was available, we would sit and hold their hand until they died and talk to them. And then we always did that behind the screens, but other than that, the screens were not used for regular casualties because there simply wasn't room. I remember a young man that came in and we went to turn him over after we'd cut off his fatigues to check his, the backside of his body and his body literally, part of it stayed on the litter. Uh, we put him back down and he actually did go into surgery and survived to be evac'd out to Tokyo. I think about him every time I give this talk because I don't know if he survived. I don't know if his name is on the wall. That's always been a frustration for me because I don't, I didn't know names. So I don't know how many of those people on the wall we actually touched um, during the time that they were in Vietnam. Um, at the end of the day, when we were finished treating whatever it was, gunshot wounds or whatever, we would just get the hose out and hose the blood down the drain, and that was pretty much the way the day went. And our days were 12 hours on and 12 hours off, six days a week. This is the only picture I have of the emergency room in action, mainly because I wasn't uh, there as a photojournalist, I was there as a nurse. 
Um, but I loved photographing and I took a lot of pictures. But I took this because I didn't feel comfortable taking pictures of GIs that were wounded. So these are two Vietnamese soldiers. And uh, the gentleman in blue is an interpreter because we spoke very little uh, Vietnamese. It was not an easy language to learn. Okay. This is the way most of our patients arrived. And I cannot say enough thank yous to helicopter pilots, who can be a crazy lot. I've, I've known a few that were just on the edge. But the helicopter saved so many lives in Vietnam. It started in Korea to be used. But when I think back to World War II, so many guys died because you just couldn't get them to a medical facility. And um, if there was a rule in the emergency room, even if you were not on duty, if you heard more than two choppers come in, you automatically went to the emergency room because you knew that meant at least two patients and probably more like four or six. So the helicopter definitely made a huge difference in Vietnam. And then you've got the biggest of the helicopters. Well, I don't know, there might be one bigger, but the, at, in Vietnam, this was the biggest one we knew. Um, you see schnooks around here every once in a while flying, and you, I, I, always, I always look up. It's just force of habit. Um, this particular situation was these guys were actually a band. They were all musicians before they joined the army, and their job was to form a band and then go around to the different LZs, the you know wide spot in the road where the guys out in the bush could come in and get a decent meal and maybe a shower. Um, and they would go around and entertain the guys who you know maybe were out in the bush for four or five months. And I had a fairly decent voice, which thanks to Parkinson's is shot to pieces. But um, I went along on occasion as girl singer. And I got lots of attention because most of these guys hadn't seen a, a woman in six months. So it was kind of an ego booster, you know. I mean, how good could you look in a pair of it? This was on that trip. I'm sitting there. We, the bottom of the schnook was open because we had a huge net carrying cargo at the bottom. And when I went back for my first trip back to Vietnam, even which was after 25 years, you would still see the things that look like cloud, like a starburst are uh, B-52 bomb craters, and the square dark gray are rice paddies. And so you, when you looked at the bottom, it, it, it hadn't changed for 25 years. Now, as a result of 50 years hence, and the Agent Orange wearing off, you do see a lot more vegetation. But I did have, I had a student, a middle school student ask me if we had seat belts. And I said, no, I don't think so. I said, but nobody fell out. So I guess we did okay. We landed all right. Next. Now this probably deserves a little explanation. There wasn't much entertainment in Vietnam. You know, this was even, this was before email and internet and all that sort of good stuff. So you had to kind of make up your own entertainment. So these guys were um, some of the hospital staff, administrative and whatever. And the guy with the plunger on his head was obviously new and they were reading to him the rules of the hospital off the uh, uh, honorary uh, toilet paper roll scroll thing going on there. And a little alcohol was consumed during the whole process that made it very festive. Next. Yeah, that's my 22-year-old body. Um, to which somebody said, I like you in the red bikini. I said, that's not even close to a bikini. <laughs> Except my father did comment. He said, I hope you didn't pay full price for that because part of it's missing. <laughs> um, we did water ski which I realize most people don't expect to hear, but because of where we were located, and again, I didn't know how we got the boat or the skis, but the same Marine took credit for it. 
So several of us did go out if we had a, a, a break in the afternoon, uh, if we, casualties weren't coming in, uh, we could take an hour or so and go out and we'd go out and water ski. The only thing was we couldn't water ski after one o'clock because that's when the sharks came in. Now how they knew it was one o'clock, I have no idea, but they seemed to gather about that same time. So anyway, next. One weekend, as I mentioned, the picture that of me in the Jeep was taken this weekend. Two guys and myself decided we would get, get a weekend pass just to get away from the hospital and go wherever. And so we took our flak, jacks, flak jackets and our steel pots and M16s and headed out for the weekend and went from Chu Lai up to Da Nang and then on up to Hue. Um, and so these are just pictures of everyday life in Vietnam. I mean, a war was going on, but they had markets and things of that sort. So you'll see um, a few pictures that look like uh, just the average Vietnamese life. Next. We were discouraged from stopping for refreshment at these <coughs> stands because there was a way, and I don't know how they did it, but we actually saw a couple people that were injured, that take the can of pop or beer, remove the bottom, and attach a grenade to the ring top. This was the old ring tops when you pulled it and you actually got something that came off in your hand. Um, and then they soldered the bottom of the can back on and when you pulled the ring top, the grenade went off. So we stuck with canteens with water and I had to tell the students, no, there was no bottled water. It was called a canteen full of water. So we chose not to imbibe on the, the roadside stands. Thank you. Very typical, and you still see this in Vietnam, rice is a major crop and it's planted underwater. Uh, there is, you still see water buffalo. Uh, at least when I was there in 2014, I still saw a water buffalo. Somebody on that, on the trip that I was on in 1996 was a woman who had no idea about anything about Vietnam. She was a travel agent. And every time we saw a water buffalo, we had to stop the vehicle and get out so she could take a picture. After about day three, I said, listen, one water buffalo looks like the other water buffalo. I think we, we can do without any more water buffalo pictures. I don't know what she ever did with all of her water buffalo pictures. This is an interesting picture. This is, and you'll think this is really not terribly brilliant, but fishing is very big in Vietnam because they've got lots of water. And these were, we called these boats, LRBs for little round boats. Now, how original is that? Um, but the reason I include it is, first of all, you'll still see them today. But when we would go out in the boat with the skis, if the fishermen saw us, they'd stand up in their little round boat and wave their arms because we'd throw them the tow rope and pull them around behind. It was a little like an inner tube. They thought that was the most fun that they had ever had. And so they were always waving their arms and wanting us to help them. Next. Sorry, if I don't do that, eventually my voice will stop. Um, I did take a 10-day R&R, and I went to Hong Kong, which was a fascinating city. And we, we my husband and I and two other couples went back in 94, 95, something like that, before, before the Chinese took it over. Um, but it's so crowded that they, they can't build out anymore. They just build up. But it truly was an interesting experience. And I just remember walking down the sidewalks and every shop owner was out and kept going, for you, first visit to Hong Kong, only three dollars, only three dollars. So it was, a, it was a fascinating trip and a good chance to get away from the war. Another wonderful thing was the Bob Hope Christmas show and I feel so privileged that I got to see it thanks to the Marines, I guess. Uh, 
But you can see how popular it was. The guys climbed onto any surface that they had to, to be able to see what was going on. And I will tell you that about five minutes after I took this picture, the monsoon skies opened up and it poured and poured and poured. Nobody moved, nobody moved. It was that important and exciting that we even took patients from the hospital down on gurneys, if the doc said it was okay. We just threw plastic over everybody. It didn't seem to make any difference. And the show went on with Miss World. He always had beautiful women. And for those of you of a certain age, the gold diggers, those women in those gold fancy dresses. Uh, Neil Armstrong was with him on this one. Connie Stevens was with him. And um, they just put raincoats on over their evening gowns and the show went on. And one of my fondest memories, not just of Vietnam, but life in general at Christmas is they closed with Silent Night. See, I've got goosebumps right now just thinking about it. And every time I hear Silent Night, I think of sitting in the pouring rain and watching Bob Hope. It was very meaningful. Thank you. Well, then back to the real war. Um, some of the realities of war, we had rocket attacks. Um, I, I've read different things. I've read a couple of books by a couple nurses. Phone seems, somebody's needed badly. Um, who said, oh, we got rocket attacks every other day. I don't think so. If we did, I slept through some of them. But we did get several during the course of the year. It was their way of the, the Viet Cong's way of celebrating, like Uncle Ho's birthday, Ho Chi Minh's birthday, uh, Vernal Equinox, Autumnal Equinox, Vet, uh, Vet Tet. Uh, any occasion to celebrate, they'd rocket us. And down south from the hospital were huge storage, oil storage tanks. And so they were a prime target because, of course, if you take out the fuel, you cripple the, the other side. So, it, you know, at five or six in the morning, the sirens would go off and we'd get climb into the bunker. Okay. And that's my good friend who I ended up hooking up with at the end of the, after we got back to the United States. And uh, the young kids don't understand, but even in war, you want to look fairly good. So you slip, we slept with rollers in our hair. You ladies of a certain age remember rollers. You don't put your steel pot on over rollers in your hair. It's quite painful. So we let the guys wear the steel pots and we just put the flak jackets on. Okay. Uh, another reality of war, and especially I think Vietnam, was the loneliness and the boredom. And I think that led to some extent to the drug use. I don't know if the drug use was any worse in one war versus the other. There was always something to uh, try to fill that spot where there was nothing happening. But this was a high school friend of mine. He sent me this before I even got orders for Vietnam. But I just liked the picture. It just kind of said, you know, what am I doing here? What's life like? I'm looking, feeling calm now, but what's going to happen tonight when it gets dark? So that's why I included this picture. Thank you. Another reality of war was Agent Orange. And this was an LZ. The LZ we were visiting that I told you about with the band, and they had used Agent Orange to defoliate as much as they could, and then the APCs came in and tore down the rest of it. Um, so I include that because for me personally, the Agent Orange was a big issue. Orphans were a direct result of the war, a reality of war. This little girl was a Montagnard, one of the indigenous tribes of Vietnam. And she, her story actually has a happy ending. She was adopted by the brother of one of the nurses. Um, so she actually grew up in the United States, but she was a sweetheart and she pretty much lived at the hospital because she had no family. Next. Um, and in, in war, civilians get injured. Um, this little boy took some shrapnel to his eye, but it, it didn't hurt his eyeballs. So we, the doctors 
just su sutured shut his what was left of his eyelid, and we actually sent him down to um, Saigon where they had a plastic surgeon and gave him a new eyelid. So, next. Despite the war, Vietnam is a beautiful country and it continues to be. Um, this was taken out the back behind our, our BOQ. The Mama Sons had done laundry and hung it on the line. Now they did that one time when a typhoon came through and so we all got new uniforms because the next morning they were all in the South China Sea. But um, it's, it, it is a beautiful country and that's part of why I, I've been back because I needed to see it again. Next. This slide I only found about 10, 15 years ago. I didn't even know it existed. This was my very last day. The hospital is behind me on the hill and um, the doctor that was taking me to the airport to fly home on my freedom bird um, took this picture of me and I compare this to the picture of me in the Jeep. I think I grew, grew a lot over the year. Okay. So then I came back to the States and hooked up with the other gal I was mentioning who was in Vietnam. She and I did a driving tour kind of to decompress through the Northwest. We left from Minneapolis, which was her town, hometown. And we did Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, LA, Vegas, drank a lot of cold duck. Who remembers cold duck? <laughs> <coughs> um, and ended up in Denver at Fitzsimmons Army Hospital, which is where we applied for civil service nursing. And we were accepted. And six months after we started in January of 71, this young lawyer from Kansas City came out for his two weeks of summer duty because he was in the reserves as a lawyer assigned to a medical unit, which made lots of sense. But he asked me out and we went out five nights in a row, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and had breakfast on Saturday. He came back to Kansas City. We called each other on the phone for a month, and that was when you had to pay for long distance phone calls. He proposed and we were married in November. And this November, it will be 50 years, so. And by the way, we, we've been back to Fitzsimmons a couple times recently. It looks so tiny next to the big hospital complex that's there now. It just, it looked, looks a lot different than it does now. So we got married and had two adorable children and a very large dog. Um, our daughter, Jen, is, uh, well, just finished teaching um, kindergarten and next year she'll teach first grade in uh, the Blue Valley School District. She is married to Matt Christensen and he teaches high school. And we have a Jen and Matt and a Jen and Matt. Our daughter Jen married a Matt and our son Matt married a Jen. <laughs> <laughs> and so our son Matt uh, lives in Victoria, British Columbia, and he's a human rights lawyer, and he's married to Jen, who is also a lawyer. So it's, it's easy, you know, you get matching towels, you can give them to, to each couple, because it works that way. Okay. I have been to DC several times, and whenever I go, I always stop to see Sharon Lane. There, her spot on the, the uh, wall, there are eight women whose names are on the wall. And Sharon was killed by direct enemy fire at my hospital about four months before I got there. A rocket hit the hospital and she was working, she was killed. So I always stop to visit where she is on the wall. Okay. For those of you who haven't been able to see it, this is the woman's Vietnam a statue at the wall I was back for the dedication. It's a wonderful, wonderful piece. It's three nurses administering uh, aid to a wounded soldier. And if you have a chance to go back, I highly recommend it. Okay. I've been back to Vietnam four times. This was on my first trip back. I went with a group of travel agents because I was working as a travel agent at the time. 
this was what's, what was left then of the Hanoi Hilton, the prison where many of our POWs spent years. Um, we weren't supposed to be back there, but you know, I snuck back anyway. And what you're looking at are uh, um, cells that were about eight by 10 and housed eight POWs in each cell. Um, and it has, this has since, this was in 1994. It was, when I went back in 96, it was torn down, gone, and replaced with something else. There is still a museum that you can visit, which is very interesting. Next. My trip back in 96 took me to where our hospital had been. This was the old gate. I went with a friend and the driver who was young said to our guide who was a college student at the end of the war in 75, he knew he could t get us to see where a hospital had been. And so this next picture is, shows where the hospital had been. And if you look real carefully, there's an island out in the middle and that's how I knew it was where there, the buildings were, but there's, there was nothing left whatsoever. Okay. That's my friend, who actually I played golf with this morning. Um, that's on China Beach, which got famous with the, the television show. Um, I never got to China Beach before the war, or during the war, but she and I went later on. Okay. Uh, another trip was in 2013, took us to the tunnels in Kuchi. I always tell people, I personally, this is a personal feeling, that if you want to understand why we were probably never going to win that war, when people can live in underground tunnels, uh, three levels, and some of them were as shallow as two feet with no electricity, and they even had schools and hospitals underground, it's difficult to fight an enemy that can sustain those, those situations. Um, but they've hollowed out some of the tunnels so you, humans can now go through. You have to go through on your knees in some of them. Um, the, the slide on the right is in, taken in Halong Bay, one of the prettiest spots on the face of the earth. These are all underwater mountains. Okay. This is the group I went with on my last trip. These are students and faculty from the College of the Ozarks in Southern Missouri. They are very high on veterans. And starting in 2009, they would take 12 veterans, partner them with 12 students, and make a visit to where those veterans had served. They had only done World War II and Korean veterans until 2014. They made their first trip to Vietnam. This gentleman on the left was a POW at the Hanoi Hilton for six and a half years. And he's explaining to these students on a mock-up of the, the prison where he was and who was in the cell next to him. Um, the picture of us, we are all gathered on the beach. I just have to say, I have such respect for POWs. When I listen to him say, point to black and white pictures and say, you know, I remember that guy, he was in the cell next to me. It just gives me goosebumps to think about it. So don't speak ill of a POW in my presence because I will, I will not pay any attention to you. And I'm going to finish with a poem it's from my book. By the way, I'm working on book number two, which will be about Parkinson's. Um, so since I don't have my glasses, hopefully I'll remember this. But it's called Remember. Remember the sound of death, the gurgle of the last breath. Remember helicopter blades, wah, 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 bringing bloodied and broken bodies. Remember the acrid smell of burning flesh and peeling skin from white phosphorus. Remember rain, rain and yet more rain. Remember the whistle of rockets splashing in the South China Sea where earlier that day we had skied. 
remembers sand, coconut oil, guitars, and music. Remember shoulders wet from tears, blood dripping on our boots, body bags cradling their silent corpuses. Remember escaping into scotch and cigarettes, writing, loving, filming, laughing. Remember leaving whole when so many were broken. Remember and share whenever you can so that no others may ever forget. Thank you.